Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time to listen to me. I'm Justine Indongo, my supervisor is Prof. Kebat, and my talk is on options in induction of labor. The content of my topic or my talk is introduction, indications, contraindication, piece of score, methods for induction of labor, complications, summary of the guidelines. We'll review the newest literature and with the conclusions, and then we'll look at my references. Introduction. Induction of labor, which is the artificial initiation of labor when the benefits of delivery are deemed greater than those of expectant management. It's one of the most frequent performed obstetric procedures in the world. It's performed in up to one in four pregnancies. And the aim of induction of labor is to achieve a timely and uncomplicated vaginal delivery with minimal associated adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes. It starts with ripening the cervix and then inducing the contractions. It tends to be longer than spontaneous labor. Our tiger bird protocols on induction of labor are evidence-based and they were last updated in April 2018. So for the aim of this talk, we will focus on the latest literature since 2018. We look at indications, maternal indications, hypertensive disorders, diabetes, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, and renal disease. Fetal indications for induction of labor, these include fetal demise, fetal growth restriction, alloimmunization with fetal anemia, oligohydromias, twin pregnancies. Obstetric indications for induction of labor, the most common indication for induction of labor is post-term pregnancies. A rupture placenta with the dead fetus, pre-labor rupture of membranes, preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, chorioamnionitis. Some of the contraindications to induction of labor, so these are any contraindication to labor, such as prior classical or high risk caesarean incision, prior uterine rupture, prior transmural intrauterine incision entering the uterine cavity, active genital herpes infection, placenta previa or vasa previa, cold presentation or cold prolapse, invasive cervical cancer, abnormal lie and abnormal presentation, fetal distress, pelvic structural deformities, two or more previous caesarean sections. Methods for induction of labor includes membrane sweeping and stripping, which in some of the literature does not fall under a formal induction, artificial rupture of membrane, mechanical dilators which include balloon catheters, single balloons and double balloons, hygroscopic dilators such as laminaria, extra amniotic saline infusion, as well as pharmacological preparations such as prostaglandins E1, prostaglandins E2, as well as oxytocin. Of course, we can't talk about induction of labor without talking about Bishop's score. Now, Bishop's score is a pre-labor scoring system which was initially designed by Prof. Emeritus of Ops and Gyne, Dr. Edward Bishop, and it was first published in August 1964. The aim of the Bishop's score was initially designed to assist in predicting whether induction of labor will be required. But with a modified Bishop's score, we now use it to assist in deciding on the method of induction of labor, which depends on whether this is a favorable or non-favorable cervix. Now, favorable or non-favorable cervix has been defined differently in the literature, with some saying that a Bishop's score of six or more is favorable, and others saying that a Bishop's score of eight or more is favorable, which means that the chances of spontaneous labor are higher or of successful induction of labor with a favorable cervix are very high. Some of the complications of induction of labor include failure of the procedure which may require end up in an emergency cesarean section or complications of normal vaginal delivery plus an increased risk for uterine hyperstimulation with or without, abnormal, with, with or without CDG changes uterine rupture, especially in multiparous women and in women with scarred uteruses, cord prolapse, amniotic fluid embolism. We take a look at the summary of the guidelines. 
The NICE guidelines, the ACOG, the WHO, the Scandinavian as well as the Queensland, we can see that in the guidelines there is no uniformity with regard to some of the issues but pertaining to induction of labour. We can take a look at this. Okay. The review, we focus on review of the newer literature. Almark et al. look at induction of labour at 41 weeks or expectant management until 42 weeks. This was a systematic review and an individual part participant data meta-analysis of randomised control trials. It included three randomised control trials, including close to 5,800 women with low-risk pregnancies. They found that induction of labour at 41 weeks significantly reduced the perinatal mortality and morbidity without increasing the risk of caesarean section, operative vaginal delivery, or perineal laceration or postpartum hemorrhage. The risk of severe adverse perinatal outcomes in the induction of labor group was significantly decreased for nulliparous, but this could not be proven for multiparous women. Dong et al. look at inpatient versus outpatient induction of labor. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. It included 12 publications representing nine trials with 2,615 pregnancies. They found that outpatient induction of labor in low-risk women is a safe, viable, and effective alternative to inpatient induction. Higher number of suspicion, suspicious fetal heart rate tracings and a shorter mean length of hospital stay was found in the outpatient group, but there was no difference in delivery method, adverse outcome, or resource, resources between the two groups. Also, there was no increased rate in caesarean section in the outpatient group. Or et al. looked at combination of folly and prostaglandin versus folly and oxytocin for cervical ripening. This was a meta-analysis. It included 30 randomized controlled trials with 6,464 five women. They, they found that the use of folly, oxytocin, Folly and oxytocin in combination reduced the time to vaginal delivery by 4.2 hours when compared to folly alone. They also found that folly and prostaglandin combination reduced the time to vaginal delivery by 2.9 hours when compared to folly alone. However, when they compared folly and oxytocin to folly and prostaglandin um, combinations, there was no difference in time to vaginal, in time to vaginal delivery between these two groups. No significant differences in maternal or neonatal adverse events in the different groups. Intracervical Foley's catheter plus intravaginal misoprostol versus intravaginal misoprostol alone was reviewed by Lee et al. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control st studies. It included eight studies and over 1,100 women. Induction of labor, they found that induction of labor using the combination of intracervical folic catheter and intravaginal misoprostol decreased induction time by 2.7 hours. The there was a decrease in the risk of uterine tachycystole and meconium staining in the combination group as compared to the misoprostol group alone. There was no difference in caesarean section rate or clinical suspicion of coronomyonitis rate between the two groups. Chia et al. looked at the speculum versus digital insertion of folly catheter for induction of labor in nulliparous with unripe services. This was a randomized controlled trial. Um, looked at 86 nulliparous women at term with unripe services, which was described as a bishop's score of less or equal to 5, and they were admitted for induction of labor. They were randomized to digital or speculum, either trans or microfolic, in catheter insertion in lithotomy position. The primary outcomes were insertion duration, pain score, and failure. They found no significant difference between the two groups for all three primary outcomes. Digital and speculum 
insertion in nullipyrus with unwrapped services had similar insertion performances. Thus, digital insertion requires less equipment and consumable and could thus be preferred and could thus be the preferred insertion method. Beckham et al. looked at women's experiences of induction of labor using prostaglandin E2 as an inpatient versus, versus balloon catheter as an outpatient. This was a randomized controlled trial across eight Australian maternity hospitals between September 2015 and October 2018. 695 women were randomized with uncomplicated term singleton pregnancies. 215 and 233 women in the balloon outpatient and prostaglandin inpatient groups respectively. The prostaglandin outpatient group received dinoprostin gel or control release step. The balloon group had a double balloon catheter inserted and went home. They found that more women in the balloon outpatient group reported they would choose induction of labor in their next pregnancy and desire the same method if induction of labor was required. The balloon outpatient group experienced higher pain scores at the start of induction of labor, but lower scores during the time of rupture of membranes. Women report similar healthcare experience following balloon outpatient compared to prostaglandin inpatient induction of labor, but are more likely to desire the same method in the next pregnancy should induction of labor be required. Avisto et al. looked at the experiences of induction of labor versus induction of labor with a catheter as an outpatient versus inpatient setting. This was a prospective randomized controlled trial. It included 113 women with uncomplicated full-term pregnancies. The women in the outpatient setting were less satisfied and more anxious than were the women in the inpatient settings. However, the differences were marginal and the general experience after induction of labor was good. Induction of labor in an outpatient setting is thus a viable option in low-risk full-term pregnancies. Peters et al. looked at the duration of rupture of membranes and mother-to-child HIV transmission. This was a prospect population based surveillance study it included close to 2,400 singleton pregnancies delivering vaginally or by emergency cesarean section in women on continuous antiretroviral treatment with information on duration of rupture of membranes. The overall mother to child transmission rate for women delivering at term with duration of rupture of membranes more than four hours was 0.64% compared to 0.34% with rupture of membranes less than four hours, with no significant difference between the groups. In women delivering a term with a viral load of less than 50 copies per mil, there was no evidence of difference in the mother to child transmission rates with duration of rupture of membranes more than or equal to four hours compared with less than four hours. Among infants born preterm with infection status available, there was no transmission in the 163 deliveries where maternal viral loads was less than 50 copies per mil. Finnecain et al. looked at membrane sweeping for induction of labor. This was a Cochrane review and the aim was to find out if membrane sweeping is a safe and effective way of inducing labor at or near term and if it was more effective than the formal methods of induction. They looked at 40 studies which included 6,548 women membrane, and they found that membrane sweeping may be more likely to have spontaneous onset of labor but no clear difference found in unassisted vaginal births. And lastly, Middleton et al looked at induction of labor at or beyond 37 weeks gestation. This was a concrete database of systematic reviews that looked at 34 randomized controlled trials, including 21,563 women, pregnant women, at or beyond 37 weeks gestation. 
They found that induction of labor reduced school birth compared with expected management. A policy of induction of labor probably reduced cesarean section compared with expected management. They also stated that induction of labor probably had no or little impact on operative vaginal birth compared with expected management. Induction of labor reduced NICU admissions. They also stated that induction of labor probably reduced the occurrence of, of low APGOS scores compared with expected management. Induction of labor made no or little difference for neonatal trauma. The effects of the induction of labor on length of maternal hospital compared with expected management stay was uncertain in this study. So in conclusion, HIV patients with suppressed viral load, it is safe to do ARO for induction of labor. Outpatient Foley's catheter is safe and well accepted. It is safer to induce labor after 41 weeks than expected management after 42 weeks. Membrane sweeping was found to reduce the rates of formal inductions. These are my references. I thank you.